do you ever see or i mean i i, I don't even think this is maybe important because who would ever use this but do you ever see a quantum laptop like a laptop that you know runs on qubits no like a quantum processor um, yeah. i personally or, don't or is that just a stupid idea like what do you think it's not a, it's not a stupid idea i don't know it, it, it's, okay. a, it's a worthwhile question and people ask these questions you know you've probably seen these quotes from i i, I forget who it was the ceo of ibm might have even been watson i i, I don't know who said he foresees, you know, a market for five or six computers in the United States one day. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's dangerous to be too pessimistic about these things. The thing with quantum computers is that they're not fundamentally a new way of building computers that just speeds up the process that you guys already understand when you think about computing. It's really a different approach to dealing with information. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've determined that there are some particular little applications where we know that would be at least a little bit faster than any possible classical approach. I don't mean faster in real time because they're physically different devices. So one might have a higher clock speed than the other, but that the number of steps required would scale better on the quantum device. Um, and then there are a lot of applications where it's not provable because we don't really know the limits on classical computing. But if you trust the expectations most computer scientists have, there'd be a huge advantage, an exponential advantage to the quantum device as you get to larger and larger problems. So one of the things a lot of people are trying to do is to figure out what's the range of problems for which that would be useful. And there are a handful of problems where we know that it seems to be useful. And many, many problems that people work on day to day where I just don't see why it would make a difference to do it quantum mechanically. So my expectation is that there's always going to be a trade-off that to make a system well controllable quantum mechanically may involve cooling or, or other things, but that's going to have some extra cost, whether it's a financial cost, an energy cost, a space cost, or just a trade off in the clock rate. It's going to mean that unless there's a reason to do it, you wouldn't want to bother. So what I could picture is that one day our laptops will all have quantum coprocessors so that when you need to call an algorithm, that quantum mechanics is known to be better for, like every time you need to, you know, break someone's credit card, it's good to use quantum mechanics for that. <laughs> uh, then it'll it'll call the quantum processor and, and do that. You know, the same way that we used to have floating point coprocessors, and now we have graphics processors and so on and so forth, and even processes that are kind of optimized for doing certain deep learning tasks and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not. Um... I don't know how to put this. It's not like a, a replacement for what we have now, but just a supplement, so to speak. That's the way I see it. <clears throat> I don't see any good reason to replace most things we do now, as long as you're just doing kind of sequential operations. You know, you're doing word processing or, or even if you're doing graphics or something like that, um, I don't immediately see the reason. Now, I could believe there's stuff you would do in the background, quantum mechanically, that could even speed up graphics. But one of the tricks is that what a quantum computer does is it makes use of this insane richness of the amount of information in a quantum state to have more paths that it can take to go from the input to the output. If you think of the job of a computer as marching along from input to output, the funny thing is that there's no difference in the size of the input or the size of the output that you get classically or quantum mechanically. So even though people like to say, oh, quantum systems can be in many states at the same time, so the, the quantum computer is solving many different problems in parallel, the fact is there's this bottleneck at the output. It can't give you any more information at the end of the day than the classical computer would have. So if you have, you know, you want to program some 3D graphics on your 20 megapixel display, uh, it's not as though you can use you know, 30 quantum bits and say, oh, 30 quantum bits, that stores 100 million complex numbers. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, you have 30 bits coming out. You can't fill up your display with it. And if you want to mm -hmm. fill up the display, you still need your 20 million bits. The question is, do you want to do some processing along the way where you're willing to throw out the intermediate steps and you still have that same amount of output at the end, but the acrobatics you needed to go through to get it just took up more space than you had in the classical system. That's, that's kind of where the, the quantum mm -hmm. thing can be useful. 
So for most tasks, I, I, I just don't see it. Um, but one of the big questions now is whether for things like optimization, uh, serious quantum capabilities offer an advantage. And there are a lot of different ways I could mean that question. There are a lot of different perspectives on the answer. But yeah, it, it does make it seem to me like most likely it will supplement abilities. And whether it supplements them in a way that's going to be useful on your laptop or mine, I don't know yet, but it's conceivable. The idea that it could provide abilities that are important in certain niche applications, like doing quantum chemistry, which is important for drug discovery and materials research or basic physics research for that matter, uh, that currently seems very, very likely. And a lot of companies are banking on the idea that different kinds of quantum computers might just help with miscellaneous optimization problems. Um, and again, that's possible, but I think the evidence is still less strong, except in a few cases. Like, you know, there, there, was, there, there are a few famous problems you may have heard of. Um, there's the traveling salesman problem. People who read a little bit about computer science like to hear this one. Uh, if I give you a list of cities, I show you where they are on a map, and I say your job is to deliver packages to all of them as quickly as possible. Draw the fastest route that connects every one of these cities. It turns out the time it would take to solve that problem grows exponentially with the number of cities. So our fastest computers cannot find the exact solution for 20 cities. And there are real companies hmm. out there spending real money on this because, you know, FedEx and UPS, that's what they do. Well, it's not what they do, right? They use hubs and so forth. But, you know, they, they do try to solve that kind of optimization problem. Many other problems can be cast into the same form. And again, as far as we know, it's exponentially difficult on a classical computer. But no one's been able to prove that. Tomorrow, someone could turn around and come up with an algorithm that, that breaks that belief. Mm -hmm. But that would stun most of the computer science and math worlds. The thing is, almost no one expects that a quantum computer would be able to solve this problem either. What we do is we come up with approximate solutions. And it turns out that classical computers are already very good at coming up with approximate solutions for that problem. And there are companies like D-Wave that think that their was, quantum computers going to mention them, yeah. are even better. Mm -hmm. um, well, they're, they're a company, so they periodically just say, we know it's better. But if you talk to an academic, you'll realize that's not true. Um, and for a while, a lot of academics were really very dismissive of D-Wave and thought they were being kind of misleading and, and said that, no, it can't do any of this. But in fact, the people who went to study it more closely had a much more balanced and nuanced view at the end and did find certain things where they said, here, it really does seem to be behaving differently from a classical machine. And I can't yet prove to you that it's using that to good advantage, but it is doing something classical and there are certain classes of problems where it seems like it might be faster. Uh, so there are related approaches where, you know, as I said earlier, the, the jury is still out.